una recomendación, si quieren seguir igualmente las actividades de Colombia 3.0, les recomiendo entrar al blog, que es blog.colombia3.0 en letras.co. Lo mismo pueden estar viendo el streaming y más información en la, la misma página de Colombia 3.0. Paul. Ok, am I actually, I'm on now, am I? Brilliant. Ok, thank you very much. Um, well, what a strange thing to be doing. Uh, I, uh, I hope that uh, I hope that I'm not that brilliant at doing this, otherwise I'm never going to get invited to another city ever again and I'll just end up doing everything through, through Skype. Um, well, um, throughout the presentation you'll hear me continually saying click forward, click forward, so I apologize for that but that's just the way it goes and uh, I'm just very grateful that you uh, have managed to get me in via this uh, digital means. Um, so if you want to put up the first slide, um, uh, I do actually have, I'm seeing the conference here streamed to my sitting room, but I think I'm slightly delayed, so uh, I'll just have to get used to it. So I'm praying now that you've got slide two up, and you can see in the bottom left or the bottom right corner, the number two. Um, my name is Paul Tyler, I'm from Copenhagen. Uh, I, uh, done various different things. I've worked in theatre for four years. I've, uh, I worked at the BBC for 12 years. Um, I worked in six years for content and um, uh, content and um, uh, format development. And I spent a couple of years teaching as well. Um, and the whole of my talk, I hope, is going to focus on um, some of the keywords that I heard in Jeff um, and Alison's talks. Um, some of the keywords which were design, strategy, uh, and context, um, and, uh, and, and, and also something that Alison talked about, which is about audience behaviours. So um, I hope, I'm hoping you got the first slide up, sorry, which is slide number two, um, and if you click forward now and go through to slide number three, you will see exactly why I was late, or not late, you'll see exactly why I'm not here, um, because uh, I'm, I'm, uh, you should hopefully see uh, Copenhagen Airport. Uh, click forward, slide four. Um, I'm praying that you're seeing these PowerPoint slides now. Um, and uh, if you click forward to slide five, um, you will see the chaos that was that was Copenhagen Airport yesterday uh, when they decided to go on strike. Yes, we have strikes in Scandinavia as well, um, and uh, prevented me getting my flights to France and then on to uh, lovely Bogota. Okay. So let's, um, let's, let's go to uh, slide six. Um, this is what I do on slide six. I help people to get from idea to concept. Um, and I hope that what I'm going to be doing now for the next uh, 40 minutes or maybe less uh, is to give you uh, some sort of idea as to how I do that. Let's go to th slide seven, please. Um, I, believe, um, I believe several things. Um, click. I believe not to think blue skies. I don't like the term blue skies. I don't think it really helps us. I like to work within constraints. Uh, we should be on page seven now, I hope, and we've already got the first line up. Click again for the second line. Um, and I believe that it's important that if we want to be engaging and relevant and accessible, we have to consider a lot more stuff. And I think that from the talks you've heard already from uh, Jeff and, and from Alison, you'll, you'll understand there's a lot more stuff that we need to be considering. Click again onto the third bullet point. Um, I think it's really important that before you construct things, you should deconstruct things and you should break things down. And if you go onto the fourth bullet point, I think that questioning is probably the most creative thing that you can do. Um, and I have only just come to that conclusion uh, later on in my life. Um, it's not something that I used to think about when I was younger, but I think questioning is, is the most creative thing we can do. Click forward to um, slide number eight, please, and click once, and you will get a sense of, oh, I hope that's not a fire alarm, is it? Um, you'll get a sense of what, what I, what the different terms that we hear all the time about this different world that we're in. Okay, so the conference is called transmedia, but people talk about interactive media, digital media, convergence media, multimedia, new media, cross media, cross platform, 
I hope you've got the slide up. So you should have seen slide eight now um, with all its various different medias. And, and you know what? I don't care. Um, it's easy for me to say that. I'm not in the same room with the, with the rest of you, but I just don't care anymore. All I care about is how can I help people within this process in order to produce things in lots of different ways. That's all I care about. So next slide, please. Slide nine. This is where it's going to get really complex. And I feel sorry for anybody who's seeing this streamed around South America because it's probably too small to be seen. But let's see if it works. So Jeff and Alison both talked about, they talked about the core story and they talked about the, the, the beating heart at the center of everything we do. And this is what's at the heart of what I do. It's about the need. And I think that that need is about exploring a theme. And this is what we have to identify. Now, I'll get on in a sec into how I work through the creative process. But I just want to give you um, a sense of how I see the landscape. So if we go back to the slide uh, and stay on slide nine, because it's going to get quite complex. Good luck. We're going to go in now. So I'm hoping slide nine is up. Can you click forward, please? And what you should see on the left of your screen is um, the three areas, book, film, and TV. Now, I've just chosen three um, typical uh, media platforms that, uh, that we all know about. Um, and what I refer to them is, is uh, I refer to them as passive audience engagement. And what I mean by that is that, that it is possible to produce um, stories uh, on these various different platforms, books, films, and TV, and to be unbelievably engaging. But I believe ultimately it's about passive engagement. I think it's about the engagement that doesn't require anything more of the audience than to get emotionally involved. And that's worked brilliantly for years, and it's going to continue working brilliantly for years. And the thing is, is that, it, that people have done in the past and they will continue to combine these things. So it may well be that somebody produces a book and then somebody ad adapts it and it becomes a film. Okay. Now, if we then click forward, um, what I would argue is, is that a commissioner or somebody financing or funding this would probably uh, want, they would probably qu qualify whether or not the need itself is interesting or is relevant. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so basically that's how it's worked up till now. We have people getting back to a need, exploring a theme, the commissioner, the financer, the funder, whatever, the interested party basically saying, do I find this need interesting and do I find it relevant to the audience? And then somebody producing a book, a film, a TV, and sometimes combining them uh, to tell stories. If we click forward now, we then see um, the way by which we measure the success of realizing that story on those different platforms. So it's about how well we realize it on the platform. It could be about story consistency across platforms, which is very much what Jeff and Alison were talking about, this sense of kind of consistency between them. I think um, Jeff talked about fractures um, and, and how important it is to ensure that we don't uh, create cracks within our uh, cross-platform um, uh, rollout. And what we also might want to check is that there's good strategy for distribution. Now, if we click forward again, we should now see hopefully on the bottom right of your screen, um, I don't know if there's right or left for you, but on the bottom right of your screen, you will see what I call active audience engagement. <clears throat> An active end audience engagement is when we, we add a say, a digital or an interactive component um, where somehow the audience gets involved. They do something more than simply sitting back and consuming it and getting... Right, and I hope I'm back. Am I back? Am I back? Let me know if I'm back or not. Am, am I back? 
Okay, great. So, okay, that's fine. So, Tenemos un problema con la conexión, en dos minutos la restablecemos. Callín Paul Tyler. Hola. Okay, can you hear me? Hello, we are back again. Am I live or? Uh, one second. Okay, we we are back, Paul. We can continue from slide number 13. Am I live? Okay, and I'm live, yes? Okay, great. I'm so sorry, everybody. I'm, I'm quite used to this. I had a four-year long distance relationship, um, so uh, this is nothing in comparison. Um, okay, so I hope you're still with me, and I hope it was a critical slide to break down in. But, um, okay, so basically, uh, if we could just click forward, one click, um, 
and then hopefully it should come up at the bo uh, at the bottom talking about the way by which we recognize the value in in having this active audience engagement and it's exactly the same as the stuff on the left but the added bit is that the interactivity enhances the story or the experience let's just move forward and click again one more click and there should be hopefully something that comes up in the top right have you You have an incoming call from. Hello, back again. Am I live? Oh, great. Um, okay, so, oh my God, good luck, everybody. Nearly lunch, I'm, so, I'm sure. Okay, so, um, so, the, the, so on, you can see at the top right there what we have is dependent active audience engagement, where there is a dependency within the system. That's where you are creating a system where you need some of the audience or maybe all of the audience to get involved, okay? I mean, a good example would be X Factor or Pop Idol, where they actively need the audience to click on their mobile phones in order to say which contestant they actually like. So what I'm trying to do with this model here is I'm just trying to break down what people seem to be doing. Because a lot of people talk about transmedia and the various different courses and workshops that I do when I'm working directly with people, they refer to transmedia. But in some ways, I don't care if it's transmedia or if it's not. What I care about is trying to understand what it is that people are trying to do. So let's now, now move, oh, sorry, click forward again. And hopefully um, you'll see... Um, on page 16 at the top, you can see the thing that we measured this by is exactly the same as the left and exactly the same as the bottom. But the last one is the dependency enhances the story. The sense that there is a dependency within the system, that is the thing that enhances it. Okay, so let's now move to um, slide number 17, okay? So my argument is, is that irrespective of whether or not you are doing one of those three different things, the um, uh, the, the, the passive engagement or the active engagement, dependent or independent, it doesn't matter, but what, irrespective of which you're doing, you are still able to break down the journey from idea to concept. And what I want to do is I want to try and talk to you about the difference between idea and concept. So let's go to slide 18. Slide 18 says the difference between idea and concept, and I'm going to go through them. Click once, first bullet point. I believe that an idea is, is essentially a hypothesis. It's like saying, I think it would be really cool if we did X. It's the thing that you think about when you're in the bath or when you're in the shower or when you've gone for a walk. Click, second bullet point. And that, that idea has to have come from somewhere. It's come from somewhere. And what's interesting now Okay, back live again. Oh my God, you are a brave audience. I, I hope there's still people left in the room. Okay, so we should have three bullet points up there at the moment. And what I'm talking about is the fact that when we have ideas, that they, they point back to needs. Click again and go to the fourth bullet point. And this points out the fact that this need that it's pointing back to, it might be your own need, it might be somebody else's. The fifth bullet point, is that that need wants to be fulfilled. That's why we have writers like Jeff and, and Alison who come along and they fulfill those needs by coming up with those stories. Okay, the one, two, three, four, five, the sixth bullet point is that, is that we have the desire to resolve or explore it. And we, the way we do that is we develop a concept. A concept, another word, it could be, I suppose, as a format. Okay, let's go to slide 19. 
Uh, and let's see if this works. Click once and we should see the word idea. And what I say is that when you have an idea, as I said, you need to work backwards. Click one more time. Okay. And we go back to need. Okay. And if you click one more time, you will see, therefore, there is a journey that we have to go on from need to concept. So you should now have on your screen idea, need, and concept. Click again, and I'll give you an example. A good example comes from a, uh, a production that I know that's been going on in Finland, a very beautiful production. And if you see, uh, it should say, number one, a preschool story where the characters resolve conflict through laughter. That is the idea. That's the idea that somebody has had. But if you work it backwards and you say to yourself, well, what is that idea? What does it come from? Click again and let's have number two, which should say for kids who are starting to interact with other kids to understand that you shouldn't fight fire with fire. So that's going back to the, to the, to the, to the, to the need. Uh, I'm hoping that I can't hear. And we get to the concept, which is number three, saying an app for the tablet for those kids who are just starting to socialize, which uses tablets, touch and face to tickle characters in order to resolve conflicts, thereby progress within the game. And this is a, um, a, 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 a production called Gigglebug, uh, which is very successful up in Finland. And basically, that is what I see as the breakdown of that uh, journey from idea back to need and then forward to concept. Okay, so let's just move forward onto slide 21 and click one more time. And this is the zone that I'm interested in. I'm interested in the in between bit, the journey from need to concept. Let's click forward now um, and get through to slide 22. So the question is what's going on in this in between bit? Now, I can only talk from a European point of view. Uh, I don't really know much, but I, I, I'm not an expert in North America or South America, but certainly from from a Northern European standpoint, where we have a lot of um, funding uh, that supports uh, production. If you look on page 22, the first bullet point, click on that, and it's engage with audience or satisfy financiers. And what I mean by that is, what are we doing in this process, this journey from need to concept? When we design things, are we really trying to design things for audiences or are we trying to design things for finances or funders click again for the second bullet point when to pop the cork when do we get excited when do we pull out the champagne and drink is it when we've got the thing financed or is it when our audiences have started engaging it third bullet point click please who is this for? Is this, is this for ourselves? We, are we purely making this thing for ourselves or are we making it for an audience? Is it just simply a piece of art that we believe is, is for our own needs or is it for our audience's needs? If you, if you click again uh, to the fourth part on that slide, then it says because that's what traditional media is unbelievably good at and that's completely fine because that's what we've been doing for years and I don't have a problem with that at all. But if we go to slide 23, we ask ourselves, why are we doing more than just traditional media? First bullet point. Is it because we're putting our stuff out into multiple platforms, medias and channels? Sorry. Sorry, putting our stuff out into multiple platforms and channels raises a series of questions. And those questions can be, bullet point one, are we doing it simply to increase reach or access? It's like spread betting on the horses. Are we doing it because we just simply want to gain control? Bullet point number two. So please click. And we want to bypass the gatekeepers, the traditional gatekeepers that, that have prevented people like, um, oh, I've forgotten his name now, um, the chap who did uh, House of Cards that Alison mentioned, uh, the guy, uh, that, that uh, Kevin Spacey. Uh, it, did he want to go down a different route because he wanted to bypass those gatekeepers? Or, question mark, click and click again, onto the fourth bullet point. Is it because we need a critical mass? Click again, fourth bullet point. Is it because we want to engage? We want to move from passive to active? Click again. Is it because we want to have a conversation? Click again. Is it because we want to create dependencies within our output? Click again. Is it because we want to mobilize action? Okay, let's move on to slide 24. If this is the case, if, if we answer yes to those questions, 
then we need to be strategic in our development. It was mentioned earlier in both, I think, both talks earlier about being about using strategy. And that strategy has to be part of the journey from idea to concept and not just after it. OK, let's click on to slide 25. So you recognize this, um, this, this uh, model from before. If we click again one time, click again another time, and click a last time, you can see hopefully the word strategy comes up in between need and concept. So this is what we have to do. One of the essential parts of the journey from need to concept is the need for strategy. Click again, and we're now on slide 27. So strategy within the design process helps us go from idea to a concept so as to fit the way audiences are trying to engage with our offerings. OK, click again on to slide 28. Where can we see a lack of strategy? OK, well, often what I find is whenever I look at concepts that I've been, that I, if I'm calling to work with a production team or a workshop or a conference or something, and I'm working with, with production teams, click Click again on the first bullet point. What a lot of concept descriptions are, they're based on hope. Click again, second um, bullet point with a picture of Kevin Costner. And what I call this is I call this field a dream syndrome. I don't know if you've seen the film, not particularly good, I don't think, but anyway. And there's this quote in it which says, if you build it, they will come. And this is often the, the hope of, of production companies, that if you simply build the thing, then audiences will come and find you because it's on the internet, so they must do. And we have to move away from this. Click again onto slide 29. What we have to do is we have to think about distribution and access, and they must be very much part of the concept design. Click again, and you get the first bullet point. So we shouldn't just stop at the platform. We shouldn't just explain what platform it's on and not explain any context. We should always be trying to explain context. Click again to the second bullet point. Because the reason is we have to explain context is because there's so much more you can do with an iPad than you could with a TV. When people used to watch TVs or used to go to a cinema to watch a film, you didn't really have to explain what they were doing because we tended to understand what they were doing. We knew that they were sitting on a sofa and watching the TV. OK, there are various different ways you could do it. You could be in your kitchen watching it, and that might bring on a slightly different experience. But with an iPad, there's a billion different things we could be doing in a, with an iPad. To simply say that we are producing something for the iPad is just too limited. But if you click again, then hopefully you get a wee. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> Am I back? Am I live? Oh good! I get, oh great! I can hear the audience. It's... Ah, great! Okay, ah, great! You are listening, right? So um, uh, click. Then, uh, so you've got consider usage. Important to, to consider the way by which something is being used. And the last, the fourth bullet point on slide 29 is to consider the user. So if you now go to slide 30, I'm getting carried away there, so excited, I was just talking to myself and the neighbours. So on slide 30, we've got an example. Click one time and you should see the first example should come up, which says, the project will publish to smartphone and tablet. This is what I see all the time when I'm seeing projects that are, 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 are putting themselves towards commissioners for financing or funding or for, for acceptance. And to me, that's not good enough. I think it could be better if you click, click one more time. Okay. Possibly better if, click again. Here's an example. It's quite heavy, but I'll read it to you anyway. Navigating the seemingly endless curated archive of high-resolution images will exploit multi-touch gestures on the tablet rather than traditional forms of keyboard navigation. Now, if somebody writes like that, and I'm sure there's a hundred ways in which you could write it better, what they're showing is that they're showing actually how the content will actually exploit certain features and functions of the platform rather than just simply saying that it will use the platform. 
Click again and I've written another heavy example. I'll read it out. The project will give people on the move a short injection of high octane entertainment. For example, at the bus stop, on the way home, into town, or whilst waiting for a late friend and therefore designed for smartphone and mini tablets. Again, what we're doing is we're considering context of use. Alison talked about it earlier. It's so important that we consider this when we are designing our concepts. So let's click onto slide 31. Now, what I'm suggesting is no huge change. Click again for the first bullet point. This is, this is evolution, it's not revolution. Second bullet point, click please. So what we have to do is we have to just define a strategy. We have to know why we're using these particular platforms, these particular medias, these particular channels. Click again for the third bullet point. We have to actively shape your concept design rather than simply following it. So we don't work out about access and distribution. After we've de developed our concept, we do it as part of it. Click again onto slide 32. Nice picture, I hope. Upside down picture. We just have to think about a change in perspective. And I'll give you an example. Click onto slide 33. When in Norway. I was in Norway uh, beginning of this year and something really interesting happened. Well, I thought it was interesting. We had about 30 people in a room and we had to go around that room and we had to describe who we, are, who we were and what we did. Okay. Click again for the first bullet point. And what I found was, was that there were only really two people in that room that we actually found interesting. Everybody else, we didn't really tune into what they did. And the reason why we found those two people interesting was because those two people didn't talk about themselves. They basically said what they could do in relation for, in, for other people. They said, my job is to help you get from A to B. So what they did was, click again so you see the second bullet point, is they shift the interest back onto us. Click again, third bullet point. They contextualized their usefulness. They basically told you how they were useful for you. So suddenly they became interesting to us. Click the last bullet point, the fourth one. It's exactly what I tried doing at the beginning of this talk by basically saying, I help people to get from idea to, to concept. And this is what the way of the shift of thinking, I think, is about being strategic. And I think this is the way that we have to think about when we develop concepts. So let's jump onto slide 34 and click one more time. So rather than simply pushing out into platforms, we have to ask how best would my target group engage with my offering? And then we can then start thinking about which platforms would be the most relevant in, uh, that we should use in order to be able to engage with our target group. Click again onto slide 35. We have to start considering somebody other than ourselves. So what we need, click one more time, is that we need insight. And click one more time. So, because I believe that strategy comes from insight. That's just not my belief. I mean, you ask any marketeer or uh, hopefully advertiser will probably say the same. Somebody in communications, PR, they would all say the same. That strategy comes from insight. So click onto slide 36. Here's the model again. It's going to get more complex. Click one more time. Arrow disappears. Click one more time. Nothing happens. Click one more time. And hopefully insight appears. So what we've got is the notion that idea, we go back to need. From need, we go to insight. Insight delivers strategy. Strategy delivers a concept. And I will go into a little bit more detail as to how I do this. And just click one more time and you should hopefully see context just to make the whole picture. Because the context is the, the setting in which this whole thing is happening. It's the setting in where the need is and it's the setting in where we are going to place our concept. So it's like an enormous kind of umbrella that's sitting around the whole of our work. Uh, click one more time. We're still on slide 38 now. Click one more time. I will go through an example here. So here, hopefully, it should say on the screen here, an awareness campaign around World War I using news stories from the time for kids. That could be an idea. You can just imagine somebody going out for a Sunday afternoon and suddenly having this idea and thinking, right, you know what I want to produce is I want to produce an awareness campaign around World War I using news stories from the time for kids. Click one more time. 
we go back to need. We say to ourselves, well, why do we need this? Well, we realize that actually it's really important for children to see how easily wars can arise from instability. So there's our need. Click one more time. And we ask ourselves, well, what is the context? What is the context of this? Well, there's lots of different contexts. There could be the context of the rise of, uh, of fascism within Europe, um, or, or at least the rise of right-wing opinions in, in, in Europe. But also, next year will be the 100 years anniversary of World War I. So, if you, so hopefully on the screen now, you've got the idea, you've got the need, and you've got the 100 years anniversary of World War I. Oh, you've jumped. Uh, uh, now, if you click one more time, you've got insight. You've already got it. Uh, don't, don't click. I can see it on the streaming. So what we've got here is, is this is the insight. You can go out there and you can find stuff out. Now, I made this up. But, for example, you might go out into schools around Europe and you discover that kids start history around the age of 10. Ten-year-olds don't self-select topics of history at school. Oh, hold on. Don't jump. You just need to go through them. That's it. Uh, stop there. That's good. Um, teachers get to choose the topic, and teachers use interactive whiteboards but have little content, and the parents are also keen at gaining an understanding of World War I. And as you have it on the screen at the moment, so don't click anymore, uh, you have a strategy. And so, hopefully, ha, I can see the streaming going here, the final bit of that is the strategy, which is from, from understanding the, con the, 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 the context, from understanding the need and understanding the insight, we can develop a strategy. So in this case, it would be to mark the 100th anniversary of World War I, we develop content specifically for teachers to use on interactive whiteboards that will exploit the links between unstable Europe and the causes of, war, of the war to children who are starting history class in school that would tie into a six-part TV documentary for an uh, early evening slot. So what I'm trying to show there is that, is that if we break the journey down from uh, idea through to concept, we can break it down into parts that will eventually help us develop a strategy. Um, and then, of course, we can then use that strategy to then develop our concept. So we now move forward, please, on to 39, slide 39. So what we have to do is we have to explore what we don't already know, because as hopefully everybody in the room agrees with me, we know there's more stuff we don't know than stuff that we do know. So what we should be doing is we should be asking questions about our audience. Who are they? What do they do? What motivates them? How they respond to our theme? Click on to slide 40. So this is about our target audience. And it reinf uh, reinforces, I think, something that Alison, Alison said about audience behavior. So on slide 40, the first bullet point, well, it's not a bullet point, but first thing is, it's not just simply about gender and age. It's not just saying this is for boys between the age of 12 and 14. What we should be doing is we should be thinking about our audience in different ways of grouping them. So, for example, first bullet point, it could be psychographic segmentation. It could be about lifestyle, personality, values, and social class. Next bullet point, behavioral. It could be about um, say, uh, knowledge of uh, attitude towards certain things, uh, how they use uh, products, what social norms that they... It could be occasional segmentation, whereby we basically group an audience around a certain event, a certain happening. So there might be some major celebration or anniversary that's going on in Bogota, and that we recognize that there will be a group of people who will be interested in that particular event. Fourth bullet point, geographic. It could be, as, it, it could be based around a location. Okay, so there are different ways by which we can understand our audience and we can ask questions around our audience that aren't just based simply on gender and age. Let's jump to slide 41. And what we have to do is we have to somehow, there has to be a connection between the way that we explore our need and the concept we develop and these people's lives. And we have to find out in their daily lives, when would we, when is it best to connect? And we have to identify the touch points because can no longer can we just simply rely on just producing something for scheduled TV where somebody else is responsible for scheduling our output. We have to make things that become relevant in the lives of our audience. So if we go to slide 42, beautiful transition, we can use user journeys. And these are some of the tools that will help us map out some of the questions for the stuff we don't know, and we can prototype the way that the user will interact with our offering. 
Let's just move now onto slide 43. So we hopefully, on slide 43, you can see a, a guy standing there and you can see his life. Now, if you click one time, you realize that life isn't just a straight line, it's an up and down curve because we have days and nights. Click one more time and hopefully you'll get a transmedia story appearing on the screen. And we've got a classic story here where we've got a character, we've got a conflict and we've got a goal. So what we can do now, if we click one more time, we will see arrows appearing on the screen and click one more time and we've got three different colored uh, um, circles on that person's life. So what we're doing is we're recognizing that there are, there are certain points within our story that we've created that we want to connect in certain points in that particular user's life. It might be points of the times of the day, it might be times of the week, it might be times of the month, but we have to consider when we want to connect to that user and why. And also the most relevant platform for connecting to them. So click again and hopefully it should come up with touch points. So what's happening at these touch points? What social norms are we reliant on? What I mean by social norms is how have people's behaviors changed because of technology? And we need to understand those changes. We need to know those new social norms in order to be able to exploit them. So for example, 20 years ago, you would never have phoned somebody up and said, where are you? Because they were at home. That's where we were phoning them. But now when we phone people up, we say, where are you? So suddenly we are interested in the location because they are mobile, because they are able to be mobile because of the technology. So what we have to do is we have to think about what initiates action and what they do next. So go on to the next slide, 48. We have to deconstruct, deconstruct, deconstruct. And go on to the next slide, 48. That's in, it's so that we can understand. So if we go on to slide 49, we have a nice little uh, designer's tool here, which reminds us about the fact that no longer have we just got to be thinking about how our audience uses our offering, our service, or whatever it is that we've produced. There are a whole range of things that we could start mapping out. We could start thinking about mapping out awareness of our offering, our service, how they understand it, when and where and how they sign up for it, when and where and how they use it, when they complete it, and then advocacy. How are they then going to encourage other people to do that? So already there, there are one, two, three, four, five, what is it, six? Six different points in where we can think about the way by which our audience is going to use uh, and interact with our service. And we can deconstruct them. Go on to slide 50. This makes it even more complicated, but we can create a matrix because at each of those six different um, activities that we need our audience to do, we could break it down into what are they feeling, what are they thinking, and what are they doing. Now, these tools, they are typical tools that would be used by a marketer or by a designer. So the notion somehow that we are doing something completely new is, is just bonkers. I don't know if that translates into Spanish. But we're not. We are basically following other people's models. We are using other people's tools to be able to make our services more relevant and more engaging for our audiences. So let's go on to slide 50. Um, this is what I do in my job uh, in handling ideas, uh, is I try to make all these various different steps uh, uh, of, of breaking this, the, the, these different um, uh, phases of the concept development process and the way that we can actually break down um, uh, from idea to concept and also the way by which we build up concept into smaller, more manageable um, uh, um, steps. Um, and what I find is, if I go to the first bullet point, is that a lot of professions, particularly within the cultural sector, are, are ironically, they're not very visible in the way that they work. They are very visible in what they produce, but often in the way that they work, they are not as, as visible uh, in, in the way that they um, uh, visualize the way that they deconstruct the world and reconstruct it. Whereas people like designers are. So I think that we have to start thinking more like designers. So second bullet point is um, on that screen is getting the models out of our brains. Because what I find is that, is that we are, we are very f good at creating very, very complex models inside our brains that have become far more complicated or complex. And the, the reason why a lot of these um, 
cross media, trans media, new media, convergent media projects don't work is because people are just too scared to have other people coming in and trying to change these ideas because they are so they have spent so long creating these models inside their brains. And what I try and do is get those models outside of their brains and onto the table. Because if you can start mapping your ideas out onto the table, out of your brain, you become much more open and more collaborative in the way that you can work. And you are more accepting of the way that other people can come ideas, bring ideas to your model. Next bullet point, you gain a perspective. If you can get the model out of your brain and onto the table by mapping it out onto the table, you will gain a perspective because suddenly you can see it from a distance rather than it's inside your head. Third bullet point, you can be challenged and you can be challenged. Fourth bullet point, you start seeing the relationships, the statuses, the dependencies, the barriers, and the inconsistencies in the way of working. Okay, If you actually start mapping things out onto the table, you will actually start seeing things that you cannot see if those things are in your head. So the message, I suppose, the central message of this talk, and I'll give you exam examples in a sec, is to try and get some of the design methodology, which is about getting the ideas and the models out of our heads and onto the table so we can actually start mapping these things and seeing them. Because, as, as you can tell from Jeff's talk particularly, these things can be very complex. And if we only keep them inside of our heads, we're going to struggle, particularly because we're going to have to collaborate with more people. Uh, fifth bullet point is that it's important that we broaden the time for input. Often when we are explaining our projects to other people, you'll find that people will only collaborate within a sort of five-minute time window because they've forgotten everything else you've talked about. It's very difficult to remember what people have said an hour ago. And even if you do remember, when you mention something to them, they will just simply say, oh, I didn't say that. But if you map things out onto the table, it's very difficult for people to actually then go back on what they said. And then you can explore that. So what you actually do is, I find that by mapping things out onto the table, you can actually talk about things that somebody had mentioned six hours ago, whereas normally if you were only talking about it, you'd forget about it. Let's go for the next slide, which is slide 52. This is a really lovely guy, Swedish guy, that I worked with um, uh, beginning of this year. And he was great because he exemplifies through these pictures um, the way that uh, often we become very good at explaining things. We become very fluent in what works. We're on slide 52. Let's move to slide 53. So here he is uh, on slide 53, and now slide 54, and now slide 55. So here is a man explaining everything very clearly in, in what he believes is his project. Go to slide 56. Now, what I do is, is I stop people when they're trying to explain their projects and I get them to map that out. Go to slide 57. I, I, I go through and I ask them questions, very simple questions, just simply to explain their project on a table using Lego, Playmobil, other toys. It doesn't have to be Lego. It can be a whole range of different toys. But by choosing objects and to, by placing those objects on the table and by mapping out your concepts, it then allows other people to see what you're doing. So go to slide 58. Now go to slide 59. And as hopefully you can see by the expression on his face, it's a fun thing to do because suddenly there's a sense of relief and release because you are suddenly getting the model that's tightly in your head and you're getting it onto the table. Slide 60. So by, by using simple objects, you can create scenes that won't really mean much to you right now looking at it, but to the people in the room will mean a lot because they will understand it and they will be able to refer back to it. So go to slide 61. So you can t see a team of people here working away at a project. Uh, the, the guy in the yellow t-shirt is, uh, is the director, I think, or the writer in this case. And by mapping out his project using different characters, we can start seeing all sorts of things. We can see the status relationship between characters. We can ask him why he chose certain objects to represent certain things. We can see the way by which his model starts building, and he himself will start seeing the barriers and the inconsistencies within his project. Go to slide 62, slide 63, and eventually slide 64. And now see slide 65. So you can see just the simple act of choosing objects, slide 66, please, 
you start creating scenes that, as I say, you won't be able to understand right now because you weren't involved in it, but the team would. And, and, and it's incredibly powerful because by looking at these, these scenes, you can go away from, to lunch, you can come back and you can continue working on it. Slim scene 67. So now let's go to scene uh, slide 68. So what happens is, is that we go from this kind of um, uh, person to slide 69, this kind of look is that you suddenly get uh, an, a deeper understanding of your project because you've got it outside of your head. So then, now let's go to slide 70, okay? And do you remember the, uh, the, the image that we had, the model that we had? Um, remember that uh, I talked about the idea that you go from idea back to need, you, you understand the context around that need, you then go out and you ask a load of questions around your target audience, you gain insight, you ask questions around the platform, you ask questions around your, what, what it is you're trying to do, you gain a strategy from that, and then using that strategy, you then develop a concept. Well, let's just very quickly towards the end here, let's just talk very quickly about how you turn strategy into concept. Next slide, please, slide 71. Once you have a strategy, you can turn that into a concept using a number of tools. And I'll very quickly just tell you about one clever tool that I use. Go to slide 72, uh, 71. Oh, sorry, you are on slide 71, aren't you, I think? Uh, which is, um, uh, just make sure you click through so you can see the word reverse brainstorming, thinking evil. If you have a strategy, all you have to do is think evil. Come up with ideas to how you'd like to break that strategy. And I'll give you the example. If you, if you basically uh, said to a load of people, a load of creative people, right, I want you to create a... Um, uh, a, a, a perfect shopping experience using all sorts of digital tools for people using a shopping center. You probably don't have Neto in uh, South America. You're probably very lucky not to have it. Um, but let's just imagine you were working for Neto and you wanted to use digital tools to enhance the shopping experience for those people in Neto. Well, the problem with that is, is, is that when people are being creative, they suddenly start thinking the most crazy ideas. They start thinking blue skies, out of the box. They come up with things that are just not relevant. But if you want to be relevant, the best way of getting people to be creative is to say, think evil. How can you ruin the shopping experience for people going to Neto? And as soon as you ask people to think evil, they will become very precise. They will say, OK, take one of the wheels of the shopping trolley. Don't price anything. Put all the useful thing, things very high up on the shelves. Um, Make sure the aisles are very narrow so that you can't push the shopping trolley through it. Um, make sure that you can't get your shopping trolley past the checkout. So all you have to do is you take all those evil thoughts and then you just simply reverse them. And then you turn them into positive thoughts. So, so suddenly you make sure everything is priced. You make sure the aisles are very wide. You make sure that all the useful things are within reach. So by thinking evil, it makes us very, very precise and it makes us really... It makes any creative ideas we have really become very relevant for the user. So, in, so I'll give you an example. Go to slide 72, and we're nearly over. Okay, so reverse brainstorming applied to that World War I strategy that I mentioned. Just click once, and hopefully it should come up with the strategy that I mentioned before, which was to mark the 100th anniversary of World War I, develop content specifically for teachers to use on interactive whiteboards that will explore the links between an unstable Europe and the causes of the war to children who are starting history class in school that will tie into a six-part TV documentary for an evening, early evening slot. Well, if you want to develop a concept on that, if you think evil against your strategy, it becomes really easy. You start thinking, okay, we're not going to give any instructions to the teachers. We're going to make the content not applicable to children. We're not even going to tell the children when the, or the parents of the children when the six-part TV documentary is going to be on. We would definitely not make that available for the... Uh, we, we, we definitely won't tell the teachers when the documentary is going to be on. In fact, we'll even schedule the TV documentary uh, before when the kids were supposed to be doing the schoolwork, so they'll actually have no chance of seeing it. We'll schedule it really late in the evening so the children won't see it. So what that shows is, is that by being very... By, being, by thinking evil against our strategy, we become very precise and targeted. And then all you have to do is you just have to 
flip each one of those evil thoughts around into a positive thought, and then before you know it, you've actually started to develop a concept against your strategy. Okay, last couple of slides now, which is slide... Oh my God, it doesn't have it on, actually. It must be slide 73, and it starts with Henry Ford got it wrong, although there is no slide number on there. And the reason why I say this is because Henry Ford supposedly, back in 1912 or something, supposedly said, click once, um, and it should come up with, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And this is the, and now it's not necessarily true whether or not he said it or not. We're not too sure if he said it or not. But you will find creative people will often bring out this quote to show that we should never ask our audiences what they want because they never know what they want. It should always be left to the creative to know what to give them. But the problem is, is that what Henry Ford got wrong if he actually said this was that actually there's some really interesting insight in this quote. Yes, of course, people couldn't predict that they wanted a car, but what this quote actually shows is that people wanted to get from A to B faster. And that's the insight that could have got from this. And just to finish off, if we go to the next slide, which should be, I think, slide 74, there's a large quote here, which came from the Harvard Business Review, so it proves that I'm not wrong. And I just want to read it out. The real lesson learned was not that, that Ford's failure was one of not listening to his customers, but of his refusal to, con refusal to continuously test his vision against reality, which led to the Ford Motor Company failure of continuous innovation, resulting in a catastrophic loss of market share from which it never recovered. This is true. In the late 20s, the Ford Motor Company had gone from something like 90% of the market share down to something like less than 20%. So, go to the very last slide, which is my thank you slide. Um, uh, thank you very much. I, um, I apologize that I'm not there. You can blame the security staff. Uh, my camera, is my camera not, okay. I will um, bring my camera. 